Hello everybody, this is Pascal from Neutrality Studies and today is going to be a somewhat special episode because I usually do this political analysis on my own, but today I've got with me my friend and colleague Tumorjin Gambatar. Jin is a medical doctor in Japan and uh, two years ago we wrote a chapter together in a book about Mongolian foreign policy so he is one of my go-to experts when it comes to Mongolian affairs because although he is not working in the policy space he has a very very close eye on his home country and he knows a lot of what is going on and he looks at things like what happened today not not two days ago yesterday when uh, Vladimir Putin went and visited uh, Mongolia in order to not only high level talks but also to sign a couple of bilateral agreements and the international community is quite mad because Mongolia is a signatory to the ICC to the International Criminal Court to the Rome Statute and would have been required by ICC rules to uh, arrest Vladimir Putin but that didn't happen so there's a lot of talk about what this means for uh, international law mm -hmm. but also for bilateral relations therefore I want to discuss this with you. Jin, welcome to the show. Well, uh, thank you very much for having me today. And uh, yes, a, a lot of people are angry uh, at what happened in Mongolia yesterday. Uh, you know, saying things like, oh, Mongolia has just forsaken its obligations to, to the International Criminal Court. And, and, and this is uh, another step backwards in, 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 you know, establishing universal justice, et cetera, and et cetera. And even the uh, Ukrainian foreign ministry spokesman uh, wrote in Twitter saying that he would work with his partners to punish Ulan Bata for his actions, which is, you know, doesn't make any sense in the first place because, well, as you just mentioned, the, the, the visit had uh, many implications in, in, in many ways. Uh, in bilateral sense, because I think I think we before we jump into the main topic, I, I think it's better to start with the just a map, just looking at a map, just look at where Mongolia is located. You know, Russia and China; those are the only two neighbors the country has, and keeping good relations with your neighbor with those two neighbors is just common sense. Just yeah. just imagine. Arresting Putin when as he lands in Lombard. What in what kind of universe does that make sense? Yeah, because it, it looks as if the <laughs> I, Mongolia I had like a third uh, a third border with Kazakhstan, but actually there is none. You are really you're a big country, but mm. you're sandwiched. Yeah, thirty two kilometers away. Thirty two kilometers, but you're sandwiched mm. between two two giants and. Maybe this is why why Valeria Putin also chose to to make this the first ICC country to go to because it's absolutely yeah. clear that he would be safe there. I mean, how would you even if he got arrested? How to get him out of the country and into the Hague? But um, even more than that, it is it is really. Uh, hypocritical for Ukraine to demand the arrest of Vladimir Putin from Mongolia because well, you exactly. know. Uh, Ukraine, Ukraine is not a member. Ukraine they just not a ratified member of the it last ICC. month. The... You know, just and it, even then, when they ratified it, they added an asterisk to it, saying that their soldiers would not be convicted of war crimes. Yeah. So, I mean, you know, this map here shows the countries that are part of the Rome Statute, so that are bound to ICC rules. Uh, green means bound by ICC rules; you signed and ratified. Yellow, uh, orange means they signed but then withdrew. And yellow means they only signed but didn't ratify. So uh, Ukraine actually ratified it last month. You're saying? Yes, in 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 August. Ah, but only only if they themselves are not put under those rules with a little asterisk. Precisely for seven ah. years. Because well, they don't I... want their soldiers to be convicted if they if they uh, were convicted of war crimes in in when Russia or Ukraine. But we don't know. It's just a height of hypocrisy, isn't it, to then like Precisely. give out these dem demands and also uh, voices in the United States. I, I, although I haven't followed any uh, official uh, official statements, but the the pressure on on Ulaanbaatar was quite high, wasn't it? Yeah, from the International Criminal Court and from Ukraine, those are the only two official uh, statements I made about the situation. Mm. Yes. But there were so, many unof well unofficial uh, statements uh, 
from the uh, foreign em Western embassies in Mombasa uh, saying things like, oh, we stand with Ukraine and, and you know, uh, condemn the Russian aggression, blah, blah, blah. Well, yes, but, you know. Yeah, I I do. <laughs> the, the point is that the the agreements also that were struck, I think, were were quite interesting. If you if we look at this one here again, mm -hmm. like uh, on the Kremlin's uh, own homepage, of course, this is front page news, and you know, not just one uh, news, but there's at least two or three uh, articles about this, among others, the what was said during mm -hmm. these during these meetings, and I think the. The atmosphere was extremely friendly, right? Your um, your president, who is also the head of state and head of government, uh, he no, not head was... of government, head of state. We do head have a prime state. minister, right? It's more like the French system, like. But the president is well, the more between the, uh, like more more parliamentary than uh, the French, Be like between Britain and France, I would say. Okay. Okay. The yeah. But this is the important one, and the, they they had like a very friendly meeting, and also uh, your president gave a quite long speech and said things like, "I am pleased to note that the traditional friendly relations and cooperation between the peoples of our countries, as eternal neighbors, eternal neighbors, have become <laughs> stronger over time." So this is the kind of language that no uh, Western European country at the moment would use, right? And the thing mm -hmm. is that Mongolia is not. A dictatorship right it, it falls kind of out of this framework of evil autocracies versus good democracies because mongolia is a good democracy <laughs> and it has very friendly relations to its eternal neighbor yes i mean uh, that, that that language is quite interesting because it works so well in the mongolian language and it's an english translation so it's uh, kind of difficult to grasp the uh you know the, the real nature of that phrase but eternal neighbor is, is Quite a lot, lot of used phrase in Mongolia regarding, you know, Russia and China, because as I said before, it is a geopolitical fact. It is a geographical fact that you cannot just, you know, move your country across the ocean. You have to deal with your neighbors. That's that is common sense. You you cannot, you know, uh, just expect to live in peace if you're, you know, or, uh, always getting in trouble with your neighbors and that that's uh the number one priority for the mongolian government i think yeah although the number mongolian government or mm. the state in general also has this so-called third neighbor policy right in which they're yes. trying to like uh, metaphorically create closer mm. links to third countries now how do you think this is going to be impacted by this visit mm. Well, yes, the third neighbor policy is uh is quite an important part of mongolia's foreign policy because uh just as looking at history, you know, uh, looking at the geographic geography and, and, and how uh, Mongolia has been sandwiched between these two giants since uh, late 17th century onwards for the last 300 years, it had only two neighbors. Well, briefly, briefly with Japan, Japanese uh, puppet states in, in, in early 20th century, and it never had any third neighbors in, in the last 300 years. And only since the collapse of the Soviet Union in 1990, Mongolia really started doing its own foreign policy. And the third neighbor policy was a vital part of that because they knew how difficult it would it was uh, during the previous centuries to be sandwiched between these two giants. And they had to find a way uh, to the outside world. And, then, and, and the third neighbor policy, well, obviously includes the United States, the European Union, Japan, South Korea, India, and not, not only those, you know, Western democratic states, of course, they are the big part of it, but also with, you know, old friendly uh, countries like Vietnam or North Korea or, you know, Turkey, uh, etc. you know, other yeah, countries it, that are not traditionally labeled as Western democracies, but they are all part of Mongolia's third neighbor policy. Yeah, you have this Ulaanbaatar dialogue, right, that is being yes. organized every year. And usually North Korea is also part of that. Um, M Mongolia is a, is a democratic country in the heart of Northeastern uh, Asia that is actually able to access and have go good relationships with democracies like uh, Japan, um, South Korea, but also autocracies like North Korea, uh, mm -hmm. China and Russia. And it's kind of a counter example for how good relationships can be among these different 
uh, political systems and that Russia and China actually don't care. Mm -hmm. They do not mm -hmm. care that Mongolia is a democracy, right? They're not mm -hmm. trying to overthrow the Mongolian government. Precisely, precisely. And and, and the, uh, I think it was almost a decade ago, the, the Chairman Xi visited Mongolia on a state visit and addressed the Mongolian parliament and they made a, quite a significant speech in Mongolian parliament uh, saying that China will always respect Mongolia's own chosen development path. That just so, that just literally means like okay we will do our own own thing and you will do your own thing that's it we will respect what you choose, yeah. And so far they've lived up to this promise, right? Nobody has yeah. in the last thirty years tried to overthrow Mongolia's government. The only well not overtly, but there there had there, there might have been some electoral interference and stuff like that influen influencing the the elections etc. But that's you know that happens everywhere all the time. It's just interesting. Well, no, because... and, and not, nothing any like CIA backed uh, coups or anything like that yet. That's exactly what I mean. I had a talk today with an Indian uh, scholar as well, and we talked about Sri Lanka, Pakistan, and uh, Bangladesh, which all of them mm -hmm. recently saw, well, uh, Coups in one form mm. or another that were in the in the favor and certainly supported openly, at least rhetorically, by the United mm. States. And something like that is just not happening in Northeast Asia, is it, when mm -hmm. it comes to the relationship mm -hmm. that Mongolia has mm -hmm. with China and Russia? Um, because Mongolia is actually playing ball with the two, right? Mm -hmm. Yes, precisely. Because, well, again, going back to looking back to history, the, the, the whole statehood of the modern state of Mongolia is tightly, tightly knit with the idea of neutrality or, or a buffer zone between these two giants. And that was the very idea of like granting independence to Mongolia in the first place in, in, in the early 20th century. Both of those countries didn't want an immediate border with it with each other and they wanted a buffer state between them. And that that that's you know that that's the beginning of the mo modern Mongolian statehood. And it, 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 the whole thing just goes on and it, it's just a continuation of that uh, historical perspective, I think. Because it's yeah. quite important to understand yeah. that, you know, while Russia and China are having a very good relationship at the moment with each mm. other, that was not always the case. And historically mm. speaking, Russia and China have a lot of um, differences. And Mongolia as a buffer zone, uh, even mm. even way back when we still had the uh, the the Qing dynasty and the mm. Russian uh, Tsarist Russia, right? They, mm. There was this agreement that you would keep this buffer zone and only once that changed, you got you, you started to get mm. uh, uh, interference also from the other side going. And although right now mm. Inner Mongolia is part of China, there is no mm. there's no question on whether that should rejoin Mongolia or not. The, the current mm. demarcation lines are pretty clear and this mm. buffer zone is serving both China and Russia quite well. Yes. Yes, precisely. Uh, you know, as you just said, Russia and China were, were at each other's throats in the 1980s. That's like quite recent in, in, in terms of uh, geopolitics. And Mongolia has, well, at times, from the beginning, during the Qin Dynasty, uh, Mongolia is part of uh, the Qing Dynasty for almost two centuries. And during those two centuries, the Qing governed Mongolia through this, well, quasi-autonomy autonomous kind of region. They We didn't see any mass uh, hand mi migrations or anything like that. They were just uh, left to their own devices for, for two centuries. Uh, and, and that started changing in the early 20th century during the Boxer, you know, the, the Qin dynasty was was thrown into uh, a chaos in, in the 1910s, right? Now, just yeah. uh, before the revolution. Yes, and, and that's, that's when the Qin dynasty tried interfering in Mongolia's internal affairs and then and, and tried starting mass high migrations and stuff like that. And that's when the Tsarist Russia came in, as you just very aptly pointed out. It was always an accordance sanitaire and both sides understood yeah, that. The interesting thing is the Soviet mm. Union kept it that way. I mean, sometimes yes. Mongolia is referred to as the 16th Republic, but it mm. never was incorporated, right? Mongolia was in Northeast Asia, what Poland or Hungary mm. uh, were in in Eastern Europe. They it was a satellite state that yes, politically was quite dependent on Moscow, mm. but legally speaking, it was it was always kept its own devices. You had your own mm. kind of Stalinist mm. dictator who did a lot of bad stuff, but it was not a part. Of, it was not like Ukraine or Belarus. A, 
integrated mm -hmm. part of the Soviet Union. Well, yes, the, 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 as you said, and then during the Soviet period, that uh, idea of neutrality was a bit skewed because, as you said, Mongolia was so closely tied to the Soviet Union that it was sometimes called the 16th Republic. That it, that, that is how dependent Ulaanbaatar was in Moscow and, and, and in its foreign policy it was basically written in Moscow and just executed in Mongolia. You know, all, all, all the ministerial orders and, and stuff like that were first written and written and drafted in Russian in Moscow and then they just sent it to Ulaanbaatar to be translated into Mongolian to be published. That's how ridiculous the situation was. And, you know, the, the, an entire Soviet army was based in Mongolia until 1990s revolution, just in case that the war broke out between the Soviet Union and China, and and Mongolia was very bad <laughs> at its uh, at fulfilling its neutral duties uh, yeah. during the latter half of the twentieth century. Yes. Yeah, but if you like look at the dependency mm -hmm. of Mongolia from both um, Russia and yes. China, it's interesting now mm -hmm. that in this in this current period where relations between Russia and China are fantastic, it seems mm -hmm. that Mongolia mm -hmm. also stands something to gain. Because if we go again to this agreement, or not, sorry, not the agreement, but the announcement that is made on the Kremlin's homepage, the speech of your uh, of your uh, president uh, translated president. Uh, reads that uh, following our talks, the two sides have signed an agreement between the government of Mongolia and government of Russian Federation on cooperation in the supply of oil and oil products and an agreement to develop project documentation for the reconstruction of TPP3 in Ulaanbaatar. TPP3, is that the uh, oil pipeline? It's a power station. Power station. Yeah. The, and we have also focused on the hydropower um, plant project, which has been under discussion for years uh, and signed a memorandum of understanding between the ministry between the ministries, I'm pleased to announce that the uh, Egging Goal project got underway thanks to bilateral efforts. So it seems that there, a lot of economic deals were probably signed or at least put on on. Well, on the at way. least on paper, yes, at least on paper, because most of those projects have been blocked by the Russian government for years. You know, citing things like uh, you know Mongolia trying to build a, a, a water dam uh, in its own borders, and then, then Russia would block it, and saying things like, "Okay, that 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 river flows into the Baikal Lake, and that would destroy the ecosystem." Blah blah blah. You know, they they have always used their influence to keep their grip on Mongolia's uh, uh, electrical system and uh, the oil supply. Yes. But now, do you think this is got this is do you think that this is something that that Mongolia got in exchange for actually doing this, for hosting Vladimir Putin and and doing this so publicly? No, I, I would, I wouldn't say that. I wouldn't say that Mongolia got anything uh, tangible from the Russian side this time. I think it was more of uh, a show for Putin. Putin really wanted to show the world, you know, that he is not alone, that he can do what, whatever he wants in his own backyard. That and is why... what he tried to show. Then why would you? Why would your opinion. government agree to that? Why? How? How could you not? You say no to that. You say no to that. The Russians would stop the oil supply. And Mongolia would freeze in winter. The entire country will freeze. Imagine Mongolia is the coldest capital on the on earth, reaching minus forty degrees of Celsius in winter. Mm -hmm. And it is heavily dependent on Russian oil and gas. That is true. Um, so yes, do you they think do have power. But but on the other hand, uh, Mongolia also has had a e extreme kind of uh, lineup of world dignitaries coming to Ulaanbaatar in the last one year. I mean, I think the Pope was there. Uh, Swiss, yeah. The Swiss president was there. Um, there were the uh, so many. Uh, help me, remind me. Even Blinken was there, wasn't he? Like a, yeah, a Blinken and, and German pre German president, uh, Slovenian president, uh, the, the Bhutanese royal family, uh, the Lauer president, uh, David Cameron. You know. A foreign uh, when he was uh, when he was yeah, foreign, 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 foreign minister yes. of the of the UK. Um, yeah. So Mongolia is like really at the moment playing with everybody, right? So I think this request from the Russian side, if it's if it was such, was probably playing into the hands of Mongolia. No. Yes, I mean that 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 in in an ideal world, yes, that would be how they would frame it. You know, okay, we are we are a peace loving country. We are friends with everyone. We have no enemies. Everyone was welcome if you were friendly to my to our country, and that's it. 
Yeah, it's not they, even they are not bound by ideologies, you know. This this whole rhetoric around, you know, the, the, the Ukraine conflict or the, the, the Israel Gaza conflict and stuff, etc., are so infused with ideologies. But in real life, human lives cannot be, you know, discussed through ideologies. So you also follow a lot I of, I mean, you're living in Japan and, mm. and you read all of the Mongolian newspapers or, or a lot of Mongolian media. You lead, read mm. a lot of Mongolian uh, 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 social media. How do the different generations, especially like the younger generation in Mongolia, perceive this Western narrative when it comes to the Russia-Ukraine war? Do they see it? Is it portrayed more often like the way the West portrays it or is it portrayed in a more um in more realist terms of this being a great power conflict well i think it, it is it is more to do with uh, each individual's um capacity for information processing i would say yeah but um if the the me the media that you watch or let's say um official mongolian mm -hmm. media whenever you you watch it is are things portrayed in the way that they are portrayed in the West or more the way that we also discuss it here on uh, uh, online oh, oh, media? Definitely like more on the realistic side than, than compared to the BBC. <laughs> so, yeah, Mongo Mongolia doesn't it, it swallow is, it the is not narrative. No, I mean, this whole narrative of good versus evil is just doesn't make sense. No, it doesn't. But I mean, it doesn't make in sense Mongolia to us and to, to a lot of people who, who I mean, watch this, but yeah. it unfortunately makes sense to a lot of people <laughs> in Europe uh, who swallow it whole. And even in Japan, sad. although the, I mean, we are both living in Japan. I think the Japanese are not as dogmatic when it comes to the, mm -hmm. to the media over here about the war in Ukraine. They more look at it as a tragedy, but still it's, it's definitely the Western spin, isn't it? Yeah. And maybe also let me ask. Well, you, I think, I think that it, 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 it the, the, there is a generational divide, you know, the, the older generation being overwhelmingly, overwhelmingly pro-Russia, because, you know, most of them were educated in the Soviet Union. They, they, you know, they have this nostalgic image of the Soviet Union and in and, and the successor state in Russia. Yeah, but also a, a little bit of a China phobia, right? I mean, China is not... It's not... No, not a little bit of that. There's a huge China phobia going on still. Um, but then let me ask you about maybe what we read down here, because um, the speech by Vladimir Putin was structured a bit differently. I mean, uh, in his, uh, as he usually does, he goes back to history. Mm -hmm. He immediately went to the oh, Second yes. World War, the Great Patriotic War, and the the um, relationship between the two the battles of Hanging Well, that's the main. The, that was the main point of the visit in the first place. Uh, the, the, this uh, visits by the Russian president happens every five years during uh, the, the anniversaries of, of the battles of Hanging Wall, the, the, the battle between uh, J Jap Japan, Russia and Mongolia uh, from 1939. And this year they're marking the 75th anniversary of that um, battle. Yes. Do you think Mongolia, because you know, one of the things that bothers me so much is that in, in Europe, we seem to only to remember um, the world started in 2022, right? Nothing, no Russian-European relations before 2022 seem to have ever existed, maybe with the exception of 2014. And this is this um, drives me crazy. Uh, is the situation in Mongolia actually a bit better where people are aware that there is a much longer history with the Russians and that you actually can have mm -hmm. a, a peaceful outcome with them? Mm -hmm. Yeah, true. It's absolutely true. Um, so, and what do you think about the these uh, economic plans now? I mean, even even um, Vladimir Putin mentions the TPP three and the hopes for more for more interconnection and also bringing uh, Mongolian students to uh, to Russia. Uh, although, like Mongolia doesn't, I mean, you are you did a lot of your studies in Japan, mm -hmm. and the, Mongolia has a lot of access to also foreign uh, foreign education. It's not that that Mongolia mm -hmm. is dependent on any single country. It's do you think not this really. will just increase the the chances for Mongolia in the future? Well, I, I'm not very optimistic about it, Mongolia. I I, I don't think Mongolia can get a lot out of Russia. As I told you before, that this visit was entirely um, from the Russian side. It was a way to show uh, Putin, uh, Putin's, uh, you know, abilities to do what he wants in his own backyard. 
from the Mongolian side, um, wasn't a pleasant deal, of course. I mean, uh, they they didn't have to do it, but they but they did it. And the way they can present it is, as I said before, in the bigger picture, in the bigger frame of its centrality policies, that they just cannot move away from where they are. They have to be friendly with everyone. Mongo I mean, Mongolia never even supported Russian invasion. They, they, they never said anything pro-war in, in, in that sense. It is, yes, it has abstained in every single UN vote condemning Russia, but it has sent a humanitarian aid to Ukraine, and it has always, always insisted that all international international disputes should be uh, dealt with through dialogue and diplomacy, and the United Nations should take more active role in mediating global disputes and stuff like that. It was, it's, 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 it's not like. You know Belarus in their way. I mean, it's 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 not on Russian camp. It's not on anyone's camp. They're just doing their own thing. So do you think? Um, yeah, yeah, I, I I completely agree with you. Which is one of the reasons why I do mm. this neutrality study stuff and channel mm. because I think like if more if more countries had like independent and and also a buffer foreign policies, we would we would be living in a in a more mm. peaceful world. And, and Mongolia is showing how beneficial this also can be. And the interesting thing when it comes then to Russia is that uh, Vladimir Putin is kind of currently obviously trying to use also the neutral routes he has, right? Uh, right after his visit to North Korea, which was clearly a show of force against the West, he went to Hanoi, to Vietnam, uh, which is not a signatory to the ICC, uh, but then mm. there he more or less explained what happened. I found that very interesting. We didn't get explanation as about the the what hap what happened in North Korea so much while he was in Pyongyang. We got it while he was mm. in Hanoi, um, and now he's he's going to Mongolia, and again this seems to be a, a strategic foreign policy trip. No, precisely. Because do you see any chance that this might also increase maybe the chances for the Ulaanbaatar dialogue and other international for, uh, for us of smaller states to gain again in importance if like the Russians seem to now want to use this diplomatic network? Mm. Yes, precisely. And, and this is uh, the role that neutral states can play in, in at any time in history. There, there are times needed, you know, for, for stuff like this. Mongolia has already shown its capabilities for stuff like that. Uh, with within uh, Lamata peace dialogue with with North Korea, Japan, South Korea, the United States, China, and Russia, and it, I think it it has a chance of playing another role here this time. You know, it does have friendly relations with basically everyone, every major player in this uh, big conflict. Do you know about any upcoming trips by other um, high-ranking foreign officials that are planned? No, I no, I'm sorry, I don't. Uh, no, I, I don't no know. These things happen like very spontaneously. They they, they just announced it like a week in advance. The, the, the Putin's visit was announced only like four days earlier. It's really interesting because Mongolia is being courted at the moment by all sides. I mean, courted or coerced in, in, the, in mm -hmm. the case of Russia, if, if your interpretation is right. But it's interesting that, that everybody seems to want to go to, to Mongolia at the moment. Yes, and, and it, I think it, it's, it, you know, it, it's playing nicely in, in, in all, 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 for all parties concerned. You know, the, the, Macron was just in Mongolia last summer and then they agreed on a deal that can see uh, Mongolia, Mongolia developing its own nuclear reactors, uh, in, you know, for atomic energy. And, and the, the Chinese side is also uh, throwing in a lot of money for hydroelectric projects and stuff like that. You know, also cooperation with India, Japan, Turkey. Mongolia is trying to get out as much as possible from all their partners and, you know, try to develop this mutually beneficial relationship with everyone. Well, I'm very glad to hear that. Um, last question. Are there any dangers that you're seeing on the horizon for Mongolia's foreign policy or its internal political process? No, um, there are no huge disasters looming. And, and when, when you mentioned like internal politics, that's also a very interesting point, because if you look at like the last 30 years, Mongolian governments change all the time. Like we have two major parties and they change power all the time. But whoever comes to power, they have never ever touched foreign policy. Mongolian foreign policy has remained the same, you know, keeping balance between your two neighbors. 
and also balance them with your third neighbors. That has been the golden rule throughout the last 30 years, and no government has ever dared reinterpreting it or in any way. Um, so I do not think that will change because the, 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 the foreign policy is intrinsically, uh, intricately tied to Mongolian statehood and its independence, as I explained earlier. Mongoli the current Mongolian state cannot exist without adhering to its neutrality policies. That is the point. And Mongolian politicians at the top do understand that, I hope. They seem to. So um, yes, and... internally, no. And from, from, from the foreign side, yes, there are a lot of pressures from all sides, you know, uh, Russia, China, the United States, European Union. There are pressures, but I think Mongolia does have a chance of weathering it in, in, in entirety and, you know, seeing better days. I think it does. That's a very hopeful note for once. Uh, a, a good a good news story. Uh, Tumurjin Gambatar, thank you very much for your time today. Thank you.